I'm always ready to cause trouble. How many people are seeing stars because yesterday was tax day? <laughs> Good evening, everybody. My name is Bob Circus, the president of the Fort Worth Astronomical Society. I want to welcome everybody here to the uh, April general meeting. It's going to be an exciting meeting. We have a distinguished guest who is uh, going to chat with us about experiences in space and other things. So that'll be great. And um, I believe we've got quite a few guests tonight. So, uh, oh, now I'm in real trouble because this isn't working. I don't have a cheat. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. All righty. So, um, oh, Welcome to visitors, if you're here, just raise your hand. You're welcome, and uh, we're glad that you're here, and we hope you uh, see Mr. John Giarmini, who sits on the back row, second uh, from the right, and, and join the club. It's a great, it's a great experience. Um, real quick. Fort Worth Astronomical Society, we've been around for 75 years. We have over 300 members, 335 members. We're the oldest astronomy club in the United States, founded in 1949. Um, board members, please raise your hand real quick. So Bill Hall, Vice President, Bruce Campbell, Director, Cy Simonson, Director and Legal Counsel, Ted Smith, Director, Monica, it, Merritt is uh, secretary, Jim Potts is a director, and again, uh, John Giarmini in the back. He is our distinguished treasurer, a job with no termination date. <laughs> okay, so, I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, so new members, uh, Michael Monroe, welcome, nice to meet you. Uh, Ricky Garrett and family, welcome. John Ryan and family, welcome. And Mark Sepulveda, and Palmer, brand new, just joined today. So, welcome everybody. It's extraordinary what we're doing. So, uh, just I'm going to go as quickly as I can here so we can get to the main presentation. It's been an exciting month for us, for all of us, because we had the solar eclipse, and I hope everybody here and everybody that's uh, online had the opportunity to see and experience uh, the total eclipse. Um, I know I did. I had a great experience leading the uh, eclipse party at Cook Children's Medical Center, and I'll, I'll chat about that a little later. Uh, it was just an awesome experience to be able to spend time with patients, families, and the staff there. It was a great experience. I know that Patrick and David and Chris and Bill and just about everybody here helped out at Total Clip. So, table rumble for the club. We, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, we had, um, uh, we did a uh, 1687 presentation this past weekend. It was awe-inspiring, it was awesome. We have, we have a photograph to show. Oh, there we go. 
Um, it was just a phenomenal experience. We had uh, a very interesting group of young people, and um, I'll chat about that a little further. We have um, 1687 this weekend, rain or shine. If, uh, if we don't see stars, we're going to do an indoor planetarium-based uh, experience. Then we have one following that. The weekend following, we have none in May, three in June, uh, I, I, and I think we got about nine others scheduled after that, so we're pretty busy. It's a great, ex great thing for us. Um, and then lastly, I uh, want to talk about Cook Children's for just a minute. We are doing, we've been battling, as you know, the weather, and uh, we are now doing our in indoor remote star party at Cook Children's on Friday the 10th. They um, consider us a premier partner. And what that means is they are going to put us up on their um, community page. Uh, they don't do this for just everybody. They're going to come out to Rising Star once we have everything up and running. And they're going to video us doing a star party. So um, that's going to help get us out in the community and, um, and some other things. So this partnership with Cook Children is, is turning into something special. Um, any questions on, on this part? Mr. Bill Hall, would you please introduce Chris Cassidy for us? Thank you. So Chris Cassidy, he's a retired uh, astronaut. He was with, he was, he was a, uh, a Navy SEAL. Uh, he was uh, on uh, one space shuttle mission and two missions to the ISS. And uh, just gonna let him have it. Chris, thank you for being here. And we've been looking forward to this. It is yeah, my all pleasure, great, great to be with everybody, first of all. Uh, let's preface this whole thing with you guys know a lot more about stars than I do. Uh, I, I just get to see them from a little 250 miles closer, uh, which, by the way, they look the same. You're a uh, little bit more solid of a dot, you know, that uh, without looking through the atmosphere, you get more of a, a, a concise dot. And same thing when looking at the moon, you can get real nice, crisp lunar images, as you guys, I'm sure, are aware of seeing photos from space station and not quite Hubble-like uh, photos. We're just uh, up there with a long telephoto lens trying to take pictures of uh, cool cool stuff. But uh, as was mentioned, I, I retired as an astronaut. I, I was in the Navy for 28 years, actually. Um, and little most people don't quite realize that astronauts are government employees. If you're a civilian, when you apply and get accepted, you just enter into the government civil servant pay, pay structure. If you're a military person like I was, you just retain your military um, rank at the time and you just promote when it's your turn to promote uh, and you keep getting your Navy, your military pay. Uh, in fact, I took a $300 a month pay, pay cut to become an astronaut. As a Navy SEAL, I had diving pay, demolition pay and, and parachuting pay. And I couldn't keep, convince the chief astronaut to let me keep the uh, demolition pay and the parachuting pay. So I, I lost a little bit of money, but it was worth every cent, let me just tell you. Uh, so I got selected as an astronaut in 2004. The first two years, you're an astronaut candidate. As you're probably aware, NASA has acronyms for everything. And astronaut candidate uh, goes by ASCAN. And you, that's not a very flattering name. So you study hard and, and try to get that through, through that process. It's really like, in all seriousness, it's like two years of space operations graduate school. You, you, it's at the Johnson Space Center. Obviously, all the training is there. Um, in my class in 2004, we had 11 Americans and three Japanese astronauts. Uh, the Japanese and the Canadians and the European astronauts all move their families to Houston and they stay there, live there. Their kids go to school in, uh, in the Clear Lake area and, uh, uh, and, and they just become part of the, the NASA culture, and we all know each other. The Russian cosmonauts, they st they stay living in, in uh, outside of Moscow, but when, once you get assigned to a space station mission, you spend quite a bit of time 
there and they here, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, so 2004, the, the two years, that's, excuse me, astronaut candidate um, learning in the classroom, then applying those lessons in the simulator, various simulators. When I got on board, we were the last class to learn the shuttle systems. Uh, so we had the shuttle and the space station to learn, and then you and then you uh, get qualified in the T thirty eight and fly around in, uh, uh, as an air crewman, and and then you get exposed. And I'm talking about these two years of astronaut candidacy. You get exposed to what else NASA does. You're, you're probably aware there's thirteen NASA centers around the country, and of course Johnson Space Center is where Mission Control is, and astronaut training is, and and Kennedy Space Center there over in Cape Canaveral. Uh, clearly where the launches are and when the shuttle was flying, where we landed the shuttle and processed the shuttle. Um, and then there's a variety of other places that do different missions. And, and we learn about a little bit about that so we can be effective, effective spokespeople out and about in the country once, once we're fully qualified astronaut. So 2006, I was a, a, a full-fledged, ready to be assigned to a mission person. In reality is you're in the back of the line. And now you just kind of do jobs around the Johnson Space Center to get more knowledgeable and uh, kind of soak it all in. And so for me, that was working in mission control as a CAPCOM, which is short for capsule communicator carryover term from the old Apollo Mercury Gemini days. We still use the same term now. Um, and then a variety of technical assignments working on other projects where they just need sort of a junior sled dog to attend meetings and take notes and um uh, and, and the like. Really, the whole purpose in the beginning is just get smarter. So you, when you do fly in space, you understand the inner workings of um, mission control and who needs to know how do you communicate and all that kind of stuff. My first mission, as was mentioned, was a space shuttle SCS-127 in the summer of 2009. We have the dubious distinction of being tied for the most launch attempts. Uh, we did. We launched on the sixth attempt. Uh, three of those, I think, were weather delays. Two of them were technical things, and then of course the sixth one we launched. I joke around, tell people, imagine you're a you're a kid in elementary school, and your parents tell you that tomorrow morning is Christmas morning. You're all excited. You wake up. You're sitting on the stairs waiting for them to call you down, and your parents come to the bottom of the stairs and go, No, 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 go back to bed. Christmas is on Thursday now. And you go to you know, wait till Thursday and you wake up and you do it all over again. They go, nope, it's not going to be till next month. And you keep doing that. Eventually, you just kind of don't realize, you don't believe that you're actually going to launch. Uh, so when when we um, the shuttle had a built-in hold in the countdown clock at T minus nine minutes. And the big go, no go happens there. And they pull all the, the positions in the control room. And the one that's the, the magic go is usually weather. And I remember when we got the go for weather on that particular day, I was like, oh my God, it's happening. Here we go. And uh, the ride is amazing. Eight and a half, nine minutes long. Um, right at the moment of liftoff, uh, you guys are a technical crowd, so you'll appreciate this. I thought in my mind's eye, it would be this massive push in my back as the acceleration just leaped, me off, leaped us off the launch pad. It wasn't quite true. The uh, the thrust is calculated to lift the darn thing at its very heaviest moment, which is clearly fully fueled sitting on the pad. And if you remember F equals MA, if, if the thrust is constant, as the mass drops, the acceleration has to um, go up accordingly to keep the force, keep the thrust the same. So um, in the case of the shuttle, we burned a, about a backyard swimming pool worth of fuel every 10 seconds, these big 17 inch fuel lines feeding the engines. Uh, and so that's, you're, you're dropping weight pretty rapidly. Uh, um, so right at T zero, you could tell that we were moving, it was rumbling, the digital numbers were changing, the altitude went from zero to five to 10. And, uh, but you couldn't really feel anything other than just jiggling uh, two sets of eyeballs looking at the, the switch that your finger's on and you get concurrence from your person to your left or to your right before you throw it. Um, in the simulator, it seems sort of silly because you're just looking at it. And But once you fly in real space and you, the, the vehicle's moving around and it's noise and uh, you, you appreciate having somebody look over your shoulder and make sure you're 
turning the right engine off instead of the, the left one or whatever, making that up. But um, so amazing trip. The very first time I saw Earth from space was in, on that mission. Um, if you'll recall, the, the shuttle Columbia was lost because on ascent, chunks of foam on the or on the fuel tank uh separated from the tank and at at uh high velocities there's enough energy in that foam to poke a hole in the wing and that's what happened and we learned from that a number of things one of those is when we resumed flying again if we could be reasonably sure that there was no missing chunks of foam on the external fuel tank then we're probably safe if if we identified miss chunks of missing foam then we would do subsequent more detailed inspections and 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 really um uh, go down the risk tree to make sure we were safe to re-enter or if we had to uh, have some alternate plan there were some crazy alternate plans but i won't get into that right now so that was my job on on that mission was as soon as the engines cut off i was supposed to take a camera and take pictures of the external fuel tank uh right at the moment of separation the commander flips the whole shuttle around upside down and the windows in the ceiling of the overhead of the of the uh, flight deck are now looking at the the uh, external fuel tank and we fly like that for a little bit as the tank kind of goes away and then we separate and that whole time taking detailed like mowing a lawn of detailed photographs of this orange tank and that was my job so i'm taking pictures taking pictures and uh and then halfway through the it's the procedure says to to change the camera lens so i dropped the camera down to change the lens and there was earth it was actually spain the straight stretch of gibraltar and uh and spain going into europe uh and we were roughly half hour into the mission and i remember thinking wow 30 minutes ago we were at zero knots and zero altitude in florida and if you take a normal american airlines flight from orlando to madrid a whole heck of a lot longer than 30 minutes um so it really kind of puts it in perspective the sense of the speed um but again it's not the speed that you feel it's the acceleration so once you get to that orbital velocity you really can't tell other than visually as you look out the window uh so that that first mission was a shuttle it was two weeks long uh all shuttles were limited in that duration du uh, duration for how much oxygen we could put in the tanks. And um, uh, I did a three spacewalks and we we brought up a portion of the space station that was um, an external experiment platform for on the Japanese module of the space station. So we were one of 30 some odd shuttle missions that it took to fully assemble the International Space Station. So that's 2009, so, um, four years later, 2013, I launched um, on a Russian Soyuz with two cosmonaut crewmates. I was a flight engineer on board. The station was up there for six months um, and then did that same exact profile on my last mission, which was in 2020 during the COVID year. I launched with two Russian crewmates and, on, on a Soyuz and spent six months there. Uh, the difference between those two missions, the first in, in 2013, there were uh, six of us on board the whole time. So a Soyuz has three seats. So you have two Soyuzes of three. Easy math gives you six people. And that's a convenient number because there's six bedrooms on the space station. So everybody's got their own private quarters um, and three three Americans and uh, usually, I mean, th three Russians and usually two Americans and then one other partner, Japanese, Canadian or European. And the uh, and and that was the 2013 mission. The 2020 mission was different because it was just myself and two cosmonauts for pretty much most of the time. There was a, a period of time in the middle of that six months where uh, the first crew Dragon capsule arrived on the space station, and my NASA colleagues Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley were the pilot and commander of that thing, and they stayed with us for oh gosh six weeks maybe something like that. So. A decent chunk of time in the middle and um and then as you remember 2020 was a crazy year with covid and a lot of civil unrest in the world and and uh the start of relationships to going a little sour with the russian and the russia and the united states uh on board we didn't really talk about it 
uh, and it didn't affect um, our day-to-day -day lives. And I, in talking to my colleagues now, it's still kind of the same way. They're getting on with their just daily life and making sure that they're operating the space station safely and together. Um, but it's just not something that as crew members, we sit up there and talk with the Russian guys, like, what's up with your country? Why are you doing what you're doing? We just generally avoid it. I personally, if you ask my personal opinion, I'm surprised that we're still launching um, uh, cooperatively with them. Uh, but it's a, it's a little bit of an insurance policy uh, on both sides. If there if there's a problem, for example, with the SpaceX capsule and, and it needs to take some months to sort out the problem, we, we barter seats. Uh, we swap every like one or two times a year, I think. Now, these days, one American on a Soyuz and, and then a Russian cosmonaut flies in a SpaceX in exchange. So there's no money exchange anymore. It's a bartering thing. Um, but it still requires astronauts to go over to, to Moscow and spend a lot of months over there and train. And um, it's just curious to me. I've been out of the business for three years. So in, in those years, as you know, the war in Ukraine is raging on and there's a lot of craziness happening. So um well, I don't. I my guess is good as yours on how long that that continues. Now, the sp the space station itself is um, uh, funded till twenty twenty eight. It certainly could go way longer than that. It's not like it's in bad shape, and it's very modular in, in construction. So, as pieces fail, uh, and and it's just a piece of machinery, so stuff fails. Um, it's easily replaceable, and we've got lots of spare parts in the in the last handful of shuttle missions. We pretty much launched as many spare parts as we could. Uh, all of the filled all the external platforms with um, components that are repair pieces for the outside systems, and then the the inside is just jam packed with with stuff. Probably too much stuff, to be honest with you. You don't you don't need uh, uh, five thousand double A batteries, but you know they're up there. So. Uh, uh, let's see, what else can I tell you? Um, I, why don't I just open it up for questions? Uh, I could ramble on a, lo a lot about different things, but maybe it's more interesting for you guys to have some time to ask questions. Don't ask me about names of stars and constellations because that's <laughs> your guys' business, not mine. <laughs> hey, Chris, um, I, I, we met before at the... Uh... National Symposium. Um, can you tell a story about your the first time you do an EVA, a spacewalk, and uh, that experience? That was a good story. Yeah, it's really cool to do a spacewalk. It's one of the more uh, space-like things that we do, and that, that sounds like a funny expression, but uh, even when you're up there, you're doing a day-to-day -day job, and um, we're doing cool ex things and science experiments and, th and that and whatnot. But it's easy when you're just inside all day long, it's easy to forget sometimes that where you actually are. But once you put that spacesuit on and you open the hatch and you go out, there is no doubt about it that you are in space. You're wearing a one person spaceship. You're seeing the ground go by, as I mentioned before, five miles a second. Um, your eyeballs are telling you that you're gonna fall. You, your, your brain still processes height like you're gonna fall. Um, so it's it, you have to really focus that uh, you can let go with your hands. Of course, we're always tethered. Um, but on my very first experience, I was um, there. You you can be one of two things: the hatch operator in the airlock, or the valve, the panel operator. And, you're, and each guy's head is or gal's head is one way or the other. And uh, my partner Dave Wolf, he was the senior guy. He wanted to be the panel operator. And that left me as the hatch guy, which was fine. I was excited to do that. And so you go through the whole process and um, just like Mount Everest rock climb, mountain climbers, they breathe, most of them breathe pure oxygen when you climb to that altitude. And our bodies inside the spacesuit um, are at the equivalent altitude of Mount Everest. That, that's where we pressurize the thing too. It's about 4.3 pounds of pressure um, greater than the ambient pressure around it. So if you put the spacesuit on in Houston, Texas, you're actually like at a, in a, your body thinks it's in a 10 foot or 12 foot swimming pool. You're, you're deeper, you have more pressure. But if you take that pressure away and you're in the vacuum, 
now the absolute pressure that your body sees is about 4.3, which roughly in that Mount Everest altitude. So long story for, we have to do this whole oxygen pre-breathe, takes about four hours to go through it, get your body acclimated to it. And then it's time to open the hatch. And right when they said, okay, Chris, open the hatch, I put my hand on the handrail, pulled it off. There's a little bit of suction that you have to overcome because the pumps can't get every molecule of air out. And I lifted it off the hatch. And right at that moment, there was a, a, um, a straw, like the straw that you drink, we drink out of our drinks. And it had floated out of the trash can. And it was right by my head. I didn't see it. And I opened the hatch and that straw got sucked out with the last puff of air and disappeared down into the white clouds. And I remember just thinking, oh my God, I don't want to be that straw. Hold on tight. Uh, but that was welcome to spacewalk, buddy. And don't let go. And, and NASA doesn't let you do anything for the first 10 minutes when you step out or? You know, it's, uh, it's not that they don't let you do anything. You're just not, you when they... Spacewalks are very choreographed things and they're very planned in detail. And the the rookie spacewalker doesn't have any jobs assigned to he or she until about 20 minutes in. Uh, and, and they just know you're going to be slow and it's called adaptation and you just take your time. That way you don't feel bad if you just really need to take a few minutes and settle in before you, they expect you to turn wrenches. Questions? Okay, hi. Hi, Mr. Cassidy. I have a question. The question is, um, do you have any advice for people who want to be astronauts someday? Yeah, be a good teammate. Nobody wants to fly in space with a jerk. Uh, so we don't pick jerks. So uh, that's the biggest thing. Uh, it sounds silly, but it's true. Who do you want to go on a cross country trip and spend a, in a car ride for, for a week, you know? Um, of course, there's the, the normal answers, which is uh, do well in school. Once you get out of school, do a, 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 as good of a job as you can with a positive attitude, the best positive attitude you have and uh, uh, in your workplace. Uh, we don't ever really hire astronauts. To, we don't hire astronauts directly out of college. So you have to have some sort of job. And it's important that you do that well uh, because those people get called and, and everything. So. Just kind of normal things, which which is uh, whatever you choose. Doesn't matter what the chosen profession is. You just gotta uh, uh, put out your best and show up. And so anyway, other than that, it's um, it's a little bit of luck. To be quite honest with you. Um, I remember thinking so that we interview typically each class. We select astronauts about every four years, and in my class, um, they interviewed 120 people and the medical facility can handle about 20 people per week. So in the week that I was in the Johnson Space Center for my interview, the other 19 folks were amazing. And I remember thinking, holy cow, I, I don't even know how I stack up with these guys. And that's just one week out of seven, six more and uh, or five, five more. And who knows? So it's a lot of luck. It's, it, you know, but it's it's worth applying. Keep on trying many times as you can apply, apply. Hello, Mr. Cassidy. Wow, I'm right next to the speaker. That is weird. <laughs> um, my question is pertaining to the Chinese Tiangong space station, your opinion of a, like how sleek and compact everything is there compared to uh, the International Space Station, what that sort of predicts for the future of spacefaring civilization. Yeah. Um, so I've never seen it with my own eyes. Uh, and there was very few astronauts that or NASA people in general who have been to China to see their space program. Um, and two of them, I know Peggy Whitson was an American astronaut. She now works for a company called Axiom. And uh, Charlie Bolden, who at the time was an NASA administrator, he was also a former astronaut. They went over to China and uh, before they had the space station launched, but they saw their launch vehicle and the two of them couldn't believe it, but it was exact replica of a Russian Soyuz. And the suits that they wear are exact 
copies of the Russian Sokol suit, which is what um, we wear inside the Soyuz. So uh, it, the and they saw components of the what would have what would ultimately be on uh, on their space station, and they were the same form factor as the Russian um, the Russian space station components. So there, whether or not they bought bought plans, I, I'm not saying, but all I know is very, very similar. And um, just smaller in design, the Russians part of this. So with that, the corollary is I can tell you about the Russian side of the space station, much smaller, um, not as much storage space. Um, and quite as just just equally as capable in um, in function, a little bit less capable in scientific and research aspects. Uh, but I'm sure the Chinese have um, other things as well. So I don't know. I'm I'm not w versed enough to give you any more detail than that. Um, I'm sure the window time on on the uh, shuttle was just awesome. You never got tired of it. But I, I wonder about zero G. Was there anything you you could you know you, that you did for fun in zero G that you never got tired of? Yeah, you, you don't get tired at all of floating and uh, zipping around the station and doing flips and things. We don't do those like during during the workday, you're busy and you're you're just kind of going from point to point. But uh, in the off hours or in the weekends, we do fun things like go see how far you can float without bumping into a wall. Uh, see how many flips you can do without going um, out of plane. Uh, just kind of fun things like that. And then, of course, looking out the window, that that is never gets old. And just watching Earth go by underneath you in the daytime, in the nighttime, uh, places that you know, places that you don't know. It's just really fascinating. It looks like Christian has his hand up. Yes, sir. How are you doing? Christian Pacenzik. Um, Captain, I would like to know if you had any experiments that you participated in that you personally found to be fascinating. Uh, yeah, yeah, lots of them. Um, some of the experiments, you really don't know what they're doing. You're just like giving up blood and urine and, and occasionally fecal samples, saliva samples. Um, and they get part of a, a an experiment that ultimately you get some data on. The ones that I thought were really, really cool that I could see what I was doing right there and the effects that my actions were taking were two things that you can relate to how they behave on Earth. One was fire, and uh, it was in this little controlled combustion chamber, and we were testing different fire retardant materials and uh, and candles burn, you know, with like a nice pointy point in space. They, it's just a ball. There's no yellow point. It's just a blue ball which was really cool and then another one was um droplet behavior water droplet behavior it was actually launched by the delta faucet company believe it or not and they did an experiment on flow the flow of water up there and, and just turning it on and watching water droplets as silly as it sounds was pretty fun now there are other ones like growing vegetables and watching animals go that are cool too. There was a fish experiment up there that I took pictures of. It was really weird to see fish all be all disoriented at first. And then there's like some alpha fish that goes this way's up, I decided. And then they all conform to that fish. Uh, yeah. um, hi, Chris. Uh, I was reading comments made by William Shatner after he went up with courtesy of Jeff Bezos. It's really hard to hear you. Can, can oh, you? Let me talk a bit a bit louder. Oh, there you go. There go. Yeah. Whatever okay, you I was reading good. the comments from Willem Shatner after his trip with uh, Jeff Bezos up at, and he said he, he felt profound grief, which apparently is a, is a known effect. And I was wondering whether you or any of your colleagues in the space station experienced that. Grief? Yeah. It's... It's called, no, the, it's I, called the overview I, effect as psychological. Yeah, I've heard a lot about it. I'm the wrong guy to ask because I'm a little bit more just 
Navy caveman guy, and I had no grief. I had no overview effect. I, I, I thought it was super cool to see the world. I thought it was amazing. It made me appreciate Earth, uh, but it it didn't it didn't uh, move me in a way that changed who I am in, in any substantial way. I do think if everybody in the world had five minutes out that window, the world would be better just because it kind of puts things into perspective for for you. Like, hey, you're your issue is not as important as you think it is, or you yourself are not as important as you think you are. Uh, it, it's just very humbling. Uh, but I had no grief uh, uh, at all. I, I have to um, beam Scotty back up and make sure I, I've seen the same thing. Um, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Cassidy, for taking the time to talk to us today. I was wondering about re-entry. Um, I have a specific part about re-entry. I'd be glad to hear you talk the whole experience, but once the shuttle gets back in the atmosphere and the wing, the wings start to have an effect, um, is it different flying in it than a regular commercial aircraft, or does it feel the same? Do you feel more acceleration or whatever, uh, more gravi mm -hmm. gravitational pull, that type of thing? And then how mm -hmm. would you compare it to re-entry in a capsule such as the, the Soyuz? Yeah. So the first part, or the second part first. So the it's really a difference in mass of the vehicles is one big part of it. The shuttle is a massive vehicle compared to the Soyuz. The Soyuz is in the Dragon now too, just much smaller and therefore uh, dynamic effects you feel more um, readily as a crew member. The shuttle was a little bit more lumbery of this thing and um, and not quite so affected by small frequency bumping. Um, so in both cases, you burn the deorbit burn like half an earth away, which I always find amazing that the computers figure out how long the direction that the engine needs to be pointed and how exactly how long you need to fire it such that you target a piece of concrete half an earth away. Uh, it, so that engine fires for about three minutes. Now you 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 start decelerating to the point where you you no longer can make a complete circular orbit, and you start impacting the atmosphere, and you and you slowly start to build the the g forces back up. We usually suspend a um, something on a string, usually a soft thing, and and that's the best g indicator that you have. Actually, there's digital ones with needles. Um, but just seeing a, to a soft toy all of a sudden start the string to start to go taut is um, is is pretty pretty uh, good indicator. And then the G's kind of pick up, and uh, in both cases, max G loading on reentry was somewhere around four and a half, I think, um, which feels a lot lo a lot bigger than four and a half when you're not used to any. Um, on on launch, your body's used to one G. Uh, until that moment on re-entry your body's used to zero g for six months and now all of a sudden you put four on it and it's like whoa what's going on here and um and then well, in the case of the shuttle once you broke through the atmosphere and now you're a glider it's it's there's more noise than an airliner because you're really moving fast still um and they we intentionally would burn the shuttle such that if you didn't do control maneuvers, you would go long. Um, we you you have you're basically trying to manage the energy that you have, and if you if you burn exactly so that you're perfect, um, the the calculated burn gets you exactly to Florida. If you slightly underburn, then you don't make it to Florida. So we 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 burn so you have more energy, and then we just dissipate the energy with some S turns if you have extra energy. Um, on your way into Florida. And so you feel those S turns uh, as, as you go. And then um, and then it's pretty much, the, the biggest difference with an airliner is it's a very high angle of attack landing. The, the nose of the aircraft's up like that kind of as you're on the final stretch. Um, so you don't, I, I, and I, I didn't really see anything, but I wasn't a pilot or, or commander. And then they and then they get a nice sight picture once they get real close to final. On the Soyuz, um, the once you get through the atmosphere, the parachute opens, and that's a crazy dynamic effect. And then you're just very peacefully falling 
until you impact and that's not so peaceful. It's a very, very um, controlled crash really. Uh, and you get, you jar the, the seats on a, it goes up on a piston and the metal, the liner of the seat is made out of honeycomb aluminum. So your body actually crunches the honeycomb aluminum a little bit too. Uh, whereas the shuttle, when it lands on the wheels, you, I, I couldn't even tell the main gear touched down. But when the nose gear touched down, you feel that because it's like falls about 30 feet. Um, but you so you can feel the nose gear. But the two main main landing gears didn't even feel them. Uh, OK, thanks for sharing your experiences with us. Uh, do you take any special precautions for cosmic rays or uh, or solar flares? That's question number yeah. one. And number two is how much are you affected by weightlessness? Because I've read articles about uh, yeah, arteries get a little hardened and and it can affect thinking to some degree, especially with the weightlessness. What do you do to counteract that besides just the extensive exercises? Yeah, we do exercise uh, up there every single day. That's not so much for um, cardiovascular health as I understand it. Uh, it's all about bone health. And uh, we do weight, weight lifting exercise to put load on your bones, particularly your spine and your hips and your big leg muscle, big leg bones uh, to keep keep them strong and keep them regenerating. And, and uh, so that when you come back, you have the same bone density as when you launched. If prior to having good exercise equipment, people were coming back with very, very severe bone density loss. Um, and your first question was, what do you, uh, what was it again? The first one? Cosmic rays. Cosmic rays. Cosmic rays. Yeah. Um, there we we wear um tlds you know decimeters uh on our body and then there's ones in our sleeping quarters and then there's uh several deployed all around the space station and uh of course there's an office in houston that does all the predictions and they'll tell us if there's a period coming that's of high concern uh in very very rare cases they may tell you to line your sleeping quarters with water bags or something like this um but it never, never happened uh, to that level when I was there. And then they just keep track of your total radiation, just like a nuclear power plant worker or whatever. So our, our decimeters come back with us in our, in our spacesuit pocket. We hand them over at, um, right there on the, on when we land to the doctors and then they take them off and somebody go process it and tell And then a couple months later, they come back and say, good news. You have enough radiation where you can fly again. And if you want, and then off you go. It's about as much as I thought about it. Hi, Mr. Cassidy. Um, my son was wondering, what was your favorite mission and why? Ooh, hard to say. Um, the first one is cool because it's your your first and you, you're you all bright-eyed bright, bright -eyed and bushy-tailed the whole time. Everything's new experience. But my favorite was my last one, I think, because I could watch that excitement in the cosmonaut who was, the, there was two cosmonauts that I mentioned. One of them, he was my same experience level, and the other guy was a rookie. And to watch his excitement with launch and everything and to share that wow factor with him um, was really cool. What was there on Earth if you that really surprised you if you were looking at Earth from from space? Um, there, there is uh, uh, some of the late big lakes. You could visibly tell how much water receded has receded over the uh, over time, and 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 they show uh, they show they tell us areas of interest to take photographs of in addition to anything we want. And I remember, uh, I, gosh, I can't remember the name of, of the lake, somewhere in, in uh, uh, Southwest Asia, uh, a big lake that's virtually dry now. That was one thing. And the other thing was during COVID, um, people often ask, can you see the smog, the lack of smog? Uh, and you couldn't see that, but it surprised me that uh, at a, a normal time you see all the airplane contrails going into JFK and um, and then into Amsterdam and London and Paris and as all the aircraft converge on there. 
Uh, in COVID, you saw no airplane travel traffic at all. It's uh, this random jet that would be coming over the uh, Atlantic or something. Uh, so that was really interesting to see the absence of aircraft travel in COVID. Well, my name is Ted Smith. And I was just wondering, what are the, uh, what are the flight qualifications that you have to have if you're gonna, if you're gonna fly, the, uh, fly the shuttle? Uh, we have to do a NASA flight physical. It's very similar to what uh, military pilots have to go through. Um, if that's what you're getting at, the medical nature of it. And then the technical part is just a bunch of training and you generally get together as a crew a year and a half or so before launch. And, and there's a whole training plan that um, you go through together. Uh, and at the end, you're a fully qualified crew ready to go. I'm, is that what you're asking? I'm not really sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I see one thing in the chat here about uh, Aurora Borealis. Um, it the you could see uh, the Northern Lights um, really well. There's some there's some uh, fantastic photographs out there. If you do a little search, you can see, and it looks just like that. Um, the best photography astronaut I know of is a guy named Don Pettit, and he's amazing at taking photographs from the space station um he's ingenious he at even like he built this gizmo with a dewalt cordless drill and measured the rotation rate and did some calculation to know how fast he needed to squeeze the trigger so the camera matched the earth's rotation the space station's rotation relative to the earth and took out the motion because that's the hardest thing about taking pictures at night uh, from there is is the a little bit of motion gives a blur, as you know. And uh, so he's, if you look, search for Don Pettit photographs, uh, he's got some amazing ones to include the Northern Lights. What does NASA do to identify space junk threats and how do they go about avoiding them? Uh, there's some secret place in, somewhere in America that, that keeps track of uh, little bitty space particles down to some size. And uh, big chunks we know about, and we generally can stay away from them. Um, but every now and then, uh, there'll be, it's, it's all based on probability and, 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 and probabilistic miss distance. Uh, and every now and, and so there's like a, a green bubble, which beyond, maybe I think it's two kilometers, uh, 2,000 meters. Uh, yeah, two kilometers. Beyond that, we don't worry about it inside and maybe i have the numbers wrong but the concept is the same inside a thousand uh meters it's a yellow and inside 500 meters it's a red uh, something like this and um when it gets if the probability of intersection is within that red zone then we we shelter in place in the soyuz and we put on our spacesuits and close hatches and we ride it out until the time of near of closest approach and then you wait no hit, okay, then you come out and go about your business. And I've had to do that a couple of times. My wife got a phone call in the middle of the night. Hey, don't, nothing to worry about, but uh, just so you know, in case you hear, Chris is um, in the Soyuz waiting out a space debris pass. Um, and I'm here telling you about it, so it didn't hit. On yeah. launch, how did the uh, ride in the shuttle and the Soyuz compare? It's just, the physics is the same in Kazakhstan as it is in, in uh, Florida. So you're overcoming the same uh, forces and the duration of the engine burn is, is relatively the same. But the biggest thing is goes back to the mass difference of the vehicles. I describe it as the shuttle is more like a big heavily loaded Ford F-350 with a cargo bed full of, of gear. If you go like this with the steering wheel, you kind of feel it move a lumber a little bit, but you stay within the lines on the highway. If you get in a um, a tiny little Porsche and with no weight in it, you go like this with the steering wheel, you're going to careen out of control. You'll feel every motion of that. And the Soyuz is, is so light compared to the mass of the shuttle. Um, I, that's what I noticed. I remember feeling every uh, control motion. It would snap to a new heading and you'd go boom, boom. It was um, very responsive and, and, and not 
not commenting on the effectiveness of the control system, it's commenting on the mass of the vehicle. And a, uh, a quick question for you. Uh, in terms of when you're up in space, is there something that you uh, feel that you miss um, seeing or being around uh, from, from Earth? Smells. You miss smells. Um, I was, I've always been up there in the summertime, so mowed grass, uh, home-cooked meals, cooked chocolate chip cookies coming out of the oven, turkey dinners. Um, all the, I grew up in Maine, so the coastal sea shore smell, um, those things that you associate, you, you can't replace those. We eat fine. We listen to music. We watch Yellowstone up there just like everybody else does but um uh it's the smells that you can't replace i've read that uh, uh they do have to reboost the space station from time to time because of air drag can you see the effects of air drag in the space station itself like if you park a ball you just no no we um in fact uh the poor man's g meter we have up there we usually put a few m m's or skittles or something in a plastic see like a old peanut butter jar jiff peanut butter jar we clean it out and and get it all clear take the label off put a few skittles in there and stick it to the wall and usually they're just kind of floating around in there and normal every day they're they're just happily and random uh when we do a reboost during the actual burn it's a very very slight you can't really feel it your body but you can see those skittles kind of all um go to one side of the peanut butter jar and and so that obviously we have real gauges too and computers and fancy things to tell us what the acceleration is but um that's just a perfect way to look up and go, oh, okay, the burns, there's a burn going on right now because all the Skittles are, are over to the side. What was your favorite thing to look at on the earth while you were in space? Um, the, well, certainly places that you know, places that you have loved ones, you know, and you're familiar with the streets and you're familiar with, oh, okay, there's, uh, there's DFW go over, there's, you know, there's, there's South, there's South Lake. Okay. I live in Keller that, you know, okay, there's Keller. I'm down Davis and you can find your house. So those, um, types of places are really, are always a favorite. Um, the ocean around the Caribbean was pretty awesome. Like it's amazing swirls of blue and, um, and then New Zealand, I thought was super, super cool to see. It was just like this really lush green thing in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. Well, um, maybe we just take one more question and, and then uh, let you guys get on with your meeting. Chris, uh, was there ever a, an Apollo 13 type of moment where you and the crew had to work together to like rectify, rectify a, a real problem type situation? In all of my time up there, there's been kind of two things that I would put sort of in that category, nothing Apollo 13 level. Maybe the spacewalk. So there's a spacewalk that I was on in 2013 with an Italian guy and his spacesuit malfunctioned and water was leaking into his helmet. Uh, and we were outside far away from the airlock and had to get back to the airlock before water consumed his head. Um, you don't want water inside your spacesuit helmet. That's a bad place for it. And uh, so that was a pretty scary and pretty sketchy. And that's a whole nother hour long talk about that. Um, and then in in 2020, we had a slow leak and it wasn't a concern to us as crew. In fact, they did the math on the, the slope of the line and it was going to be like 35 days until it even tripped the alarm. And the alarm is at a level that you're still playing safe. So we had lots of time, but we were just dumping um, oxygen and air overboard and that's not very effective. So we needed to find it and just the the process of the process of um elimination and closing hatches and reading pressure gauges and sleeping in different areas 
because you never want to isolate yourself, put a hat, a closed hatch between you and your emergency vehicle. So that was a whole kind of two or three week long um, uh, hunt. Well, I appreciate you guys uh, giving me an hour of your time. Thank you very much. Um, what a cool thing it was to see that eclipse. I, I was down in Waco with with uh, with some folks, and um, what it, I've seen partial ones as as everybody here have, probably has too. But what a difference between ninety percent and one hundred percent, right? It 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 ten percent doesn't quite do it justice on the on the, what you're seeing and feeling. Anyway, fantastic, wonderful to be with you guys. Have a great time, and and the Medal of Honor Museum will open a year from right now in Arlington. So come by and see us next year. Chris, thank you for your service, and we appreciate you joining us this evening. Okay, all the best. Take care. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, what a, that, was, that was a treat. That's an absolute treat. So we're going to have a 10-minute break. Yep, it says 10. We're going to have a 10-minute break. Right after that, uh, we're going to do raffle, and then it's off to what's in the sky. So... I'm going to turn on the lights, so watch out. Glasses on. <laughs>
So, so this is, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the stuff that's going to be in the sky for the next month until the next meeting. And when you're ready, Chris. So, you know, usually I have the cover picture and stuff, but I thought what I'd do for this is take everybody's pictures. Yes, sir. Yeah, so so I what I did was I just put together this this uh this collection of, of, of what everybody posted from wherever they were, Indianapolis or South Texas or here in Fort Worth or Arkansas. Um it was cool to see where find out where everybody was and how the skies did for them. So uh go ahead and uh go ahead and hit uh next and just let it roll. I love it with the dinosaurs with the glasses. <laughs> so Chris, Christian Sinzik, uh actually got a write up in the Dallas Morning News for his, uh -oh, for his uh, presence out there. Bob Circus at uh, Cook's Children's Hospital. I took my dad to see his first solar eclipse never seen him so quiet before. <laughs> Lots of pictures of uh, sun funnels, which is just a hit. I know that some people got that, but hey, got a nice picture. I call that t terrestrial nebula. John Paul's slamming rendition of the uh, the Corona, and uh, this is Jim Potts' Diamond Ring. Just some really stunning stuff. That this is actually this would actually do well. When I first saw it, I was I told my dad I was like, you know, that's like a logo for like a good cult or something. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it really kind of says it right there. Next slide. Next slide. All right, so bright comets this upcoming month that are magnitude 10 or brighter. We all know that uh, periodic comet 12, Pons Brooks, is still in the sky. Um, it was about magnitude 4.5 during the eclipse, so you couldn't see it uh, with the naked eye. I don't know if anybody tried looking for it with binoculars. Did anybody try looking for it with binoculars? You tried, so there's one person. Do you know why there's only one person? Because there's this amazing eclipse thing going on over there. <laughs> Who wants to look at a You know something? I'll look at the comet at night. <laughs> huh? The cloud picture. The cloud picture? There you go. So, and we also have uh, 2021 S3, 
which is in Cygnus, that is dimming. Um, but the good news, and if you go to Aerith.net, it actually tells you all sorts of stuff. The good news is we're not done yet. Now, Pons Brooks put on a really good show, but for the rest of the year, we actually have, we're actually expecting some pretty good uh, comets coming through. So it's, uh, it's going to be a good comet year this year. Uh, this is Christopher Ashford's uh, shot of, oh my God, I said 14P. That's 12P. Fact check myself. Beautiful structure. And picking up that red, whatever that red is. I don't know what molecule causes red and ionization. Chris, do you know? Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to quiz you. Uh, next slide. Asteroid Hebe. Sixth, it's the sixth uh, asteroid ever to be discovered. Uh, it's the fourth largest asteroid in the belt. Um, it's uh, actually going to be at opposition. I, I, I do this, I feature the top ten, uh, the first ten discovered. The, the, they were the easiest ones to discover, so it's the first ten um, asteroids in the, uh, that were discovered. Um, it's going to be near Arcturus. Uh, in Boetus, it's going to be uh, magnitude 9.9, .9, and um, oh yeah, this is funny. Um, in 1977, um, a moon was claimed to be discovered around Hebe, and they decided to call it Chibi, as in Hebe Jeebies, uh, <laughs> which is cute. But um, they even uh, like uh, after a Hubble investigation, they, they actually never found a moon, but. It was a fun thing, to, fun thing to do anyway. Next slide. The Lyrids meteor shower. So, um, Comet 1861 G1 uh, gives us a meteor shower. It peaks on uh, Monday night, April the 22nd, through Tuesday morning, the 23rd of April. Um, it's got a peak rate of about uh, 18 uh, per minute. I mean, 18 per minute, 18 per hour. And um, uh, it's, we're, we're looking at a 14-day 14 uh, 14 old moon, so we're looking at pretty darn close to full moon. Uh, Chris, uh, Chris Cassidy mentioned that Don Pettit is the photographer. This actually happens to be a picture that Don Pettit took, and he took a picture of a Lyrid meteor coming into the atmosphere. So this is, when he said, when he said Don Pettit, I was like, oh, I got a picture, I'm gonna line it up right here. This is great. So uh, next slide. All right, full moon. So April's full moon is Tuesday, uh, April 23rd, as you know from the previous slide. Gonna ruin that one, but uh, this is a great picture of the moon by Robert Cargill, who has some stunningly sharp pictures of the moon as of late. Um, next slide. So then there's the Ada Awkward's meteor shower. This is one of two meteor showers that Halley's Comet actually produces for us. Um, the other one being the Orionids, I think. Um, from the, uh, uh, we, get, we get the meteor shower. It's fast moving meteors. Um, they can leave long lasting vapor trails. Uh, because of how fast they move. Uh, that peaks on uh, Saturday night, May 4th, and end of Sunday morning, May 5th. And that uh, hourly rate is about 30 uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, we're looking at a 27-day-old waning crescent, so it's gonna be nice and dark in the sky. This is a good one to catch. Um, this is really familiar shape, and I, it's been bothering me, and I, I don't know what's I don't know, I was, I was eating some mashed potatoes the other day. And <laughs> Anyway, uh, next slide. New moon. Uh, eh. So uh, this is Sean Paul's picture. I'm in love with your picture, man. So the, the next uh, new moon is uh, Tuesday, May 7th. It's not as cool as the last one, but it's still a new moon. That means dark skies, so next slide. Okay, so... The other asteroid this month that's actually going through opposition is uh, Pallas, which is the second asteroid uh, discovered. Uh, it's about, uh, it's second, it's just a little smaller than Ceres, and uh, it's going to be in Hercules at magnitude 9. Um, cool thing about uh, Pallas is that it's got a really high uh, inclination uh, to the uh, solar system plane. 
Um, it is the largest known object uh, in the solar system to not be rounded by its own gravity, which is one of the planet rules, you know. Um, it was also discovered by uh, this guy while he was trying to verify Cirrus' discovery the year before. So it was a, it was a happy accident right there. Uh, next slide. All right, so Mercury is going to be at great, greater western elongation. Uh, that means that it's in the morning because it's west of the sun in the sky. Um, Thursday, May 9th is the elongation, but it's on uh, Monday the 13th that Mercury is going to be its highest. 13 degrees isn't really high. It's, it's not one of the most spectacular uh, appearances of Mercury at, at an elongation, but it'll do right now. Um, next slide. Oh, yeah. All this uh, hubbub about the eclipse, lest us not forget, it's galaxy season. So this time of year, um, you know, the night time of the Earth, we're facing away from uh, the core of, uh, of the Milky Way, and we're looking out into open intergalactic space where all of the goodies are, the little faint fuzzies that we wait for every, uh, every uh, spring. Um, Fall is, fall is okay, summer is okay, winter is absolute no-go because we're actually looking through the galaxy um, at night and it's just, it's too much contrast, it's too many stars in the way, it's, well, there's the galaxy in the way, so, and there's a lot of, and there's a lot of dark uh, dust that's uh, in between us. I mean, it's, there, there's enough dark dust that we can't even see the core of our own galaxy, so we're certainly not going to see through it. Um, this picture is actually uh, M51 by our own George Lutch. Next slide. Okay, so I just wanted to throw this in because it's a pretty cool little graphic that I found. If you ignore the picture of the uh, Milky Way behind it, it's basically explaining graphically how the Earth, if you see that celestial pole, if you have the celestial pole here at the springtime, it actually took me a little while to figure this one out. But springtime here, it's like at night, not facing the sun at night, we are looking up through the thin part of the Milky Way. Whereas in the uh, wintertime, we're... Um yeah, I still can't figure this one out. Next slide. <laughs> I'm out. Okay, so because it's galaxy season, sorry about that, it's just, yeah, I'm still working on it. So um, because it's galaxy season, I decided to feature Coma Berenices, which is Queen Berenices' hair. Uh, very, uh, very uh, big story about some stolen hair and all that, but I won't go into mythology here. Um, Ptolemy uh, depicted it as the little tuft at the end of uh, Leo's tail. And uh, it's always really been, uh, ever since, like, back to the some ancient civilization that uh, always really been regarded as an asterism. But it's always kind of been in the picture. But it was Caspar Vopel uh, who actually made it a constellation on his uh, 1536 globe. So at a time when you could, like, make a star atlas and just decide that, you know what? That's going to be a constellation now, and it's stuck to the day. Um, it's got eight Messier objects in it. It's got two stars uh, with known planets, uh, with a known seven of them total, and one named star called Diadem, which is a crown, so kind of fitting with hair thing. Uh, next slide. Messier 64. So this is a great one. This is known as the Black Eye Galaxy. Um, it's a very sightly thing to see uh, in a telescope and in pictures. Uh, the gas in its outer regions is orbiting the core opposite of its inner region, which, as I've spoken about earlier and in previous months, is a clue that it has succumbed to a lot of galactic collision. And what that does is that sheer friction between those two creates an enormous amount of starburst uh, uh, activity that happens between those, uh, those two moving planes there. Um, right here, smack dab in the middle here, next slide. This is Christopher Ashford's picture of uh, 
of the black eye, and you see the little, little dark, uh, dark thing there. It looks like a little black eye, also known as the evil eye galaxy. Next slide. So we got the needle galaxy. This is one of my, it's always been one of my favorite galaxies. Um, it's an edge-on galaxy. It's also known as NGC 4565. Because of its, it's got this small central bulge. It's up here. It's up here in the uh, where the yellow circle is. Go to the next slide here. And this is a beautiful picture by George Lutch, uh, which uh, has a really great uh, uh, detail shot of the uh, uh, the uh, dust lane in there. And um, it's uh, actually about one third larger than the Milky Way and uh, the longest apparent length of any galaxies that we have in the sky. So, next slide. So there's the coma cluster. So we're talking about a galaxy cluster here. Um, it's home to almost uh, 1,000 large galaxies and about 30,000 small ones. It actually is the densest known uh, cluster that's nearby to us, relatively speaking. And um, it's actually so dense that they're pretty much identifying that that really forces a lot of galactic collisions because there's so many galaxies in this little space. Next slide. And this is uh, actually Adam Block at Mount Lemmon. Uh, this is an image of uh, the coma cluster, and it's just lousy with galaxies. It's beautiful, um, beautiful cluster. A bit small in the sky but it's there. Next slide. So we got the Virgo cluster. So Coma Berenices is home to the Virgo cluster's uh, northern part. The rest of it is in Virgo. Um, we're looking at a, a, a much closer uh, cluster. This is actually, we're in the local group, which is our galaxy cluster. Virgo cluster is uh, a neighbor, and both of us, uh, the Virgo cluster and the local group, are components of the Virgo supercluster. Um, the northern part contains M100, Messier 85, 99, 88, 91, and uh, it's just a, a delight. If you've never run a telescope through this area, it's, it's an all-nighter right there. It's, it's fantastic. Next slide. So this is, uh, this is an image uh, with the ESO telescope. And um, the, uh, the little black things here aren't planets, so I'll settle down. Uh, they're, they're actually just stars that have been taken out to, uh, to eliminate the, uh, the contrast issue, but these are all galaxies. So uh, next slide. By the way, hey, go back, go back to that slide real quick. You've got a, you've got a, this is Markarian's chain right here, and then you've got the northern stuff up here. And, um, it's uh, these these big guys right here, uh, ellipticals, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of spirals in here and stuff. So, uh, next slide. So this is a this is a nice graphic that I came across that actually gives kind of a 3D view of what we're talking about when we're talking about galactic clusters and superclusters. Um, every one of these little dots is a galaxy cluster <laughs> and we're talking about super clusters and right here in the center is where the local group is we're looking this way towards coma Berenices. you got the virgo super cluster right there and the coma super cluster right there and it's a part of this big long thing called the uh the coma coma wall yeah so uh yeah just uh just really kind of gives a little bit of a, uh, an idea of, of where these things are in relation to each other. A very large scale situation here. Next slide. NGC 4789. So, you know, it's a dwarf galaxy, but it was discovered in 2006. This is just another galaxy that they found that orbits the Milky Way. And uh, it's very small and it's very faint. But uh, if you go to the next slide here, this is uh, the uh, Hubble's uh, picture of it. It orbits the galaxy, the Milky Way, that's going to eat it someday. So there you go. Um, next slide. 
So M53, um, it's beautiful uh, globular cluster. It's actually known for a large number of stars called blue stragglers, which are basically um, a mystery to astronomy. Um, they don't really understand why um, these stars burn hotter and brighter than they should, according to their mass, um, following the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram in the main sequence, um, they really shouldn't be burning at this sort of brightness and, and temperature. So um, they're, they're actually much hotter, and they're calling them blue stragglers. Um, if you'll go to the next slide here, you can see there's um, actually a... Uh, uh, next slide. That's okay. So this is yet another one of Christopher Ashford's fine uh, pictures, but uh, this, is, uh, this is M53. So um, next slide. Okay, so <laughs> I didn't, there are so many things that I could feature with such a tiny little constellation as Com Coma Berenices. There's 1,019 deep sky objects that you couldn't find in there. And um, so I, I uh, uh, the skylive.com uh, features them, uh, constellation-guide.com. Um, I use a lot of Wikipedia for my sources. Um, I invite you to dig deeper into the, uh, the galaxy clusters and the uh, galaxy super clusters. Coma filament, that's the word I was looking for. Uh, coma wall, coma filament, same thing. But just to read about those things on the scale that they are, it really is very mind-blowing. He's talking about structures that large that are together by gravity. They're, they're, they're influential with each other on gravity on an enormous, ridiculously enormous scale with ridiculously enormous uh, mass involved to, to generate that gravity. Um, next slide. And one of my favorite non-sun pictures by Bruce uh, Campbell um, is uh, our logo with uh, a colander with, uh, with, uh, with the eclipse and partiality running through it. So keep looking up and uh, that's it. Keep looking up. Thanks a lot. All right, watch your eyes. I'm going to turn the lights back on. Yes. There's a re the most recent article in Astronomy Magazine, or in, the most recent article in Sky and Telescope Magazine has a, uh, an article about uh, sun's creation or star creation and mentions blue stragglers is what one of the theories is. So it's in the most recent Astronomy Magazine. Or sky, it's Sky and Telescope. Okay. Well, thank you. I haven't read it yet. Thank you, Mr. Bill. Awesome as always. The magical voice of the Fort Worth Astronomical Society. Okay, well, outreach. We have a lot of reports. Uh, so let us start with Patrick McMahon. He does... Um, outreach, general, generalized outreach. All right, so, uh, it's kind of a, we're on a light schedule right now. Uh, we only have a few uh, star parties between now and the next meeting. So the first one is uh, Harvest. This is one we've been to before. It's up in Argyle. It's basically a, almost like a small town unto itself. They're having a space day, and they usually get a really good turnout. So we have that. Then, uh, then the next week, South Hills High School star party. We've been there a few times. And the last few times, we've ended up on a balcony. So I'm hopefully to get us on ground level this time. So update on that, but it's actually well tended. And then our next Dinosaur Valley Star Party will be Saturday, May 18th. And before I hand up, I got a uh, notice from, um, Matt gave me a package, uh, the Night Sky Network had uh, sent us a couple, couple of uh, eclipse pins for all our effort during the solar eclipse. 
I wish we had a couple more. I can sit and try to purchase some more, but there's two people I want to recognize. I do want to thank everybody for helping out, whether you're here or there, uh, Chris, for the live stream, everybody around downtown. But uh, a couple I want to give is, uh, I know he's not here, but Christian, Christian, hmm? yeah, I'm bad at pronouncing the name, but uh, he went down to Dinosaur Valley, as you all know, it was a last minute thing, handled over a thousand people, got a nice Got a nice uh, write-up, of course, about our club in the uh, paper, Dallas Morning News, so I'd like to give him one of these pins so the next time I see him, I'll hand it to him. And then uh, this another one I give to David Bergman. This was a last-minute one. He uh, helped out with the uh, North, Richland, North Richland Hills Library, so I appreciate his effort for that. And, of course, everybody else who helped with the eclipse. So thank you. <laughs> John McCray. The Mr. Tandy Hills. I'd like to start out by thanking everybody that came to the Tandy Hills Star Party last Saturday night. I know we had two other star parties, so our attendance I was very pleased with. We had 10 members and seven scopes and about 30 well-engaged, curious uh, visitors from the Fort Worth area. So our next meeting is May 11, and I know that's the day before Mother's Day, but it uh, we'll have a four-day old, I think a four-day old moon. So we're not going to have much of a moon, no planets, uh, but we'll give it a try and see what we can do. So come on out. And for new folks who have new telescopes or want to learn how to use their telescopes, that is a perfect place. Tandy Hills is a great place. Um, can we go back to the list? No, presenter, outreach, presenter list. Sai, Sai. Oh, young astronomers. So we got our young astronomers the third, no, the fourth uh, Tuesday every month at the Bedford YMCA. Um, I forget what the stop start time is on this one. Six p.m. Oh, no, that was the last one. Um, the other one, next one's going to start at 7 p.m. But check the, uh, the Bedford YMCA uh, Facebook page. It's got the information. And the class is going to be on constellations. Unfortunately, I will not be there. Getting my shoulder replaced that day, so I'll be laid up a little bit. But we're still going to do a class and then some viewing afterwards. So please show up. Um, if you're a young astronomer, we teach you a lot of great stuff there. Next. Thank you, and um, I'm, I'm going to be a poor replacement for Cy on Tuesday, so I appreciate any and all help. We'll need some, a few telescopes, and uh, uh, it's, it's always a great experience. Okay, so I'm going to talk about 1687. They, um, they're a uh, they're an organization that uh, provides facilities for other charitable organizations so they can have retreats and um, they, they focus on, uh, for example, this weekend we're going to have uh, family or couples that are adopting. Last weekend we had um, developmentally challenge folks, um, they will do military folks, and so it's, it's a great organization. The facility is, is top notch. So this past weekend, uh, we did a, a, a star party uh, for, for some, um, I always get stuck on what the right word is, I don't want to insult anybody, but um, uh, these were great kids, great young people, and it was just an extraordinary event. It was short, um, but it was exciting. Uh, I had two folks at my telescope who were enthralled with the polar alignment process. That's a, and I you know, spent time doing it, and 
they were watching uh, SharpCap and they were reading every instruction that SharpCap puts on the lower part of the thing. And dad gummit, I, if I didn't learn something because I, you know, they were reading and they, it was great. It's exciting to watch young folks, uh, folks of any age, be able to participate and, and learn because I wind up learning things. So we have um, two more this month. Uh, we have, uh, it's actually Saturday the 20th, they've asked us to switch the days. And we do these outreach programs rain or shine. So if we can't see the sky, we have um, uh, a Stellarium based program that we run based on what's in the sky that day and some of the photographs that the AppSync guys use, and um, so uh, it, it'll, it should be quite cool. On the 26th of April is a, a military retreat. Uh, that's a Friday. We always do a Friday as a primary date and Saturday as a backup date, uh, although I'm, I'm starting to lean towards seeing if I can switch them to a Saturday as a primary and Friday as a backup date. So. We arrive before six, they provide dinner, it's a uh, nice fellowship, and then we have our, our star party. And we always have a meeting uh, the Thursday before, and I'm sorry, the Wednesday before, I'm getting my dates mixed up, the Wednesday before each uh, event out there, we determine uh, what we're going to be doing, and uh, which we decide on what whether we should go based on the weather. And if we don't do outside because of the weather, then we can minimize the number of folks that have to travel out there. Um, so we have two days left in April, then we don't have any in May, and then we have three dates in June. So we are going to need some help. Uh, we need usually uh, four people, uh, four telescopes, and uh, we have uh, a couple in June that are going to be large. They're going to be over 60. Typically, this last one we had 26 people. The one previous was about 35. So, uh, next. Okay, I've, I'm going to talk about a little bit about Cook Children's. So, um, as you know, we've been, we've been working to do uh, an indoor star party, which is ba it's essentially going to be remote astronomy. And uh, we've got that scheduled for uh, Friday the 10th. And uh, that'll be a later start, be about 8 o'clock. Uh, and we, a group of us, uh, Chris, myself, Bill Hall, uh, went went to uh, the medical center a couple of weeks ago. We think we've got a good process. We'll probably get back down in there again for another trial run. And um, this is gonna be a very good partnership for us. They, they want us to do these star parties um, once a quarter or so. And as I mentioned, they're going to include us as one of their key community partners, which, um, it's good for us because it'll get us out there, and um, the more outreach we do, the more people, I hope, will uh, join us, because I think we do a lot of really exciting stuff. Are there any questions so far? Okay, so Bruce Campbell is gonna talk about Rising Star, Rising Star Development, and then I've got some more details to add. Say again, field condition, right? No, let's do that No. in other business because we're gonna take a vote. It's slightly different. So you'll, you'll see when it gets okay. going. Okay. So I wanted to give you an idea of what's what the uh, uh, Rising Star observing area currently looks like right now. So let's go to the next, next slide. Um, these are the people, well, in the first quarter of this year, um, we've, we, have, we ask you to sign the, the log book so we can see how many people have come out. Um, so in the first three months of the year, we had 17 folks come out, uh, or 17 signatures, 
17 signatures. That is 17 signatures. I can hear my voice now. Great. Uh, people who are out there to look at the stars. Um, 40 people came out to work on various projects that we had out there, and most of them have been associated with phase two, where we've uh, put in the observatories as well as the pads. And then a couple of people come out for groundskeeping activity. So go to the next slide. Uh, so in terms of the field conditions, the field was re recently mowed, uh, the weeds are gone, the grass is now at a manageable level, and it's ready for anybody to come out to Rising Star to uh, enjoy it. Um, the next mowing event is in a couple of weeks, and that should be, be before the ribbon cutting. Is that that's, still? That's going to be deferred. Deferred. Well, it'll still be in two weeks because the grass and the weeds grow like weeds. So we'll be out there in another couple of weeks to cut it out. And then when I show you the pictures, I want you to notice that um, to the right of the green building, some dead trees were removed to remove trip hazards and just make it easier to move around the green building. So let's look at pictures. So if you're standing in the middle of the field and looking west towards the entrance into the fields, you see some of the construction activities that we have in place. We have the, uh, the observatory that's out and a few of the pads, as well as the yellow bollards that are up that have been electrified, which means you can plug into them. Uh, into the, in the first few are the leased facility, leased um, pads. Uh, the, the next picture, uh, you're looking east, um, and it really doesn't help with the glare of the lights. So let me turn off the lights because it really is a beautiful side out there. Um, so this is in the middle of the field looking east. If you could back up one slide, this shows you what it looks looking west. Um, the grass is starting to green up because of all the pre precipitation we've had recently, and the field's looking good. Let's go, go to next one, and then this one. So there's the green building, and the trees are cleared off to the right-hand side. Um, so that's looking good. And then if you look the other direction, you see, see some of the other pads. The grass isn't growing currently as well because that's where the construction crews had to come in to pour the concrete. So a little setback, but trust me, the grass will start growing again. <laughs> um, just did want to point out that we have some, the, the roadway between the gate and the observing field has developed some ruts due to the wet spring and the heavy traffic that we've incurred with heavy trucks and just vehicles um, going in and out. Um, but we've working, we're working on a few pl uh, plans to uh, repair those ruts. And then the last thing I wanted to say, oh yeah, the burn band has been lifted. We were in a burn band for a while, but with the, with the rains we've had out in Eastland County, uh, the burn band has been lifted. But the county judge wants everyone to use extreme caution with any outside burning. We don't do any outside burning at uh, Rising Star, but that's just a reminder that we're in an area that can catch fire and burn very easily. And then I did want to mention the Eastland County Sheriff Patrols. The club set up an agreement with the, the sheriffs, um, and so the county deputies will be driving by our facility just to check on it. They've, they've come to the gate uh, that's locked, and they peer into the field to see what activities are going on. Um, and if the gate is open, they'll drive into the observing field to see what's happening. I was out there on Monday, and I, I was messing around with the lawn equipment, and then I turned around, and the sheriff deputy was driving away. I guess he figured anybody that's working on lawnmower equipment and, and the field that's just been mowed is a good guy. <laughs> but if you're there, and, and if asked, be just prepared to identify yourself. Um, uh, they're there to help us and protect our stuff that's out there of all our hard work we put in, and just be, be ready to explain what you're doing. And invite them to a star party. That's we're, a great idea. We're going to do a first, first responders only party over the summer time. All right. So if there's anybody that's interested in going to the Rising Star that hasn't been there and have some questions that they want to discuss, uh, contact me at Bruce Campbell, and I'll be more than happy to help you with that process. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah, it, it, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm biased, but the, the place is really looking awesome. Only word I can think of. Tom Roth, Palo Pinto, anything exciting? 
I just saw him. Oh. Uh, George Lutch, are you online? Okay. I'm here. Uh, any updates on the website? Uh, no, sir. Just waiting to uh, convert over. Okay. Awesome. Anybody uh, present have any announcements they'd like to make? We haven't got to the financial reports yet, Mr. John. We have not forgotten you. Okay. Next slide, please. And our financial report from our permanent treasurer, Mr. John Giormini. <laughs> Can you enlarge that, please? Make it be, oh, yay, there, just like that. Um, so every month we go through this showing what we have uh, balance in our um, Wells Fargo account. Basically, the funds are broken up between what I refer to as general fund that doesn't have a specific target, as opposed to the project funds, which are uh, typically money is acquired for from donations and fundraising uh, to do things such as Rising Star. Uh, we do have. Uh, the 1670, 1687 group, we have uh, receivables that we deal with uh, for every uh, event that we assist in. Uh, the uh, project money, of course, has <laughs> come down a bit, but there's been a lot of activity out there. You can see from the expenses uh, down below, uh, $10,000 worth of project fund expenses. That, that's a, a lot of dinero. Uh, upcoming, uh, oh, by the way, we did change insurance companies uh, from where what we have had since I don't know when. It was before I started. So for at least five years, I don't know when they started with the other one. But now we're uh, paid with uh, Liberty Mutual. And uh, there was some question about uh, officers and directors insurance. And according to the last email I saw from uh, Dorothy, I'm not sure what her last name is, uh, that does, I guess as the insurance agent, uh, that policy, those components will be about $1,260 more than what we're already paying. So on upcoming expenses, we have the yearly astronomical league, and um, does that have three zeros or four? Whatever that is, it's $1,100 or thereabouts. Depends on how many members we have. <laughs> it's updated, I did it five minutes ago, come on. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we also have uh, a room fees. We paid through May, so we have one more uh, meeting here that's paid for, and then we need to pay for the rest of the year, which is June through November. Uh, that's coming in, and then there is um, renewal season, which starts May 1st. So. The new fiscal year starts on June 1st, and we start the renewal process during the month of May. So be sure and watch your email, because you'll be getting notices about that. Um, so we're currently at uh, 212 member accounts. We have... Uh, 351 members. The difference between the two is the accounts are identified by uh, uh, to, for payments. Uh, Night Sky Network identifies this, uh, that is their unit of identification in the software. So we, we identify the members in a family, but they're not individual accounts. They're a family account or an individual account. 
Uh, so right now we're sitting at 212. I think we have one more uh, uh, bales that look, we're waiting. I think I sent up into the bales uh, 30 minutes ago. Uh, but we're up to 212. Okay. <coughs> Uh, Mark is not here, right? Sepulveda, is that correct? Is he on uh, Zoom by any chance? Nobody knows? Okay. Um, this is the tallest I've ever seen our members. Go ahead and uh, page down, please. So this is, this is as tall as I've ever seen our membership accounts. Um, I think when we first, when I first got involved, we were in the 120s or 130s, uh, and as I said, now we're up to 212. So that's really been a lot. There, it, there is. Uh, you keep going down. Uh, some of the items that need to be worked on, uh, hopefully, in this month, is the internal examination. So I believe Monica says she's not going to be here. So we need to get one, possibly two people involved to assist with that. Uh, Mr. Potts is uh, likely to be one of those two. Um, but we need another person so we can get that accomplished. Uh, I have been updating the, the uh, website with meeting information and other detail to keep it a little bit more current. Um, we only have one person uh, waiting to become a member and that's the, uh, I'm going to mess this up I'm sure, Re uh, Bales. They're the only person that's waiting for membership. Um, what else we got? Doodly doo -doo -doo. What worked? I think that's enough. So, sometime, uh, yes, question? Did we see any refunds from the termination of our old insurance policy, or did we carry that all the way to the end of the term? We carried it to the end of the term. This year? Yes. We did receive um, tax payment from Uline that did come in. So we got that. We had paid tax on a purchase, and uh, we asked for that back, and they gave it to us. Anybody else have a question? Okay, thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, to, to point out, the total membership is 351. That's bloody awesome. And I'm going to hand it over to Legal Beagle. I think I got a slide. Next slide. Should be another slide. Okay, so we went over this in the March, in the February meeting, actually. Um, this is the change to the, to the bylaws to address the lease pads. Next slide. Uh, we made some changes there. Um, this talks about the leased equipment, the leased assets. We talked about that. Uh, and it's been published in the Reflector, I'm sorry, the Prime Focus. Um, magazine. So what we need to do now is take a vote on that. So members only, if you're a visitor, please don't vote. So all in favor of amending the bylaws, as we've demonstrated the last couple of months, just please raise your hand. And opposed? Looks good. Monica, I'll get with you with numbers. I did some counts uh, on quorum and everything, so I'll get with you. All right, so that's passed. Um, we will have a lease agreement done in the next day or so for the people who are leasing pads. It's official now. Next slide. Uh, yeah, we do all that. Next slide. Um, elections. Next slide. Right, so, um, June elections. So we need to have a slate um, by May. Um, Bob Sirkis, he's got to uh, he's got to leave. We got uh, Bill Hall, who's going to stay. Monica has expressed a desire to move on from uh, the secretary position because she uh, travels a lot. Um, John's term expires. Um, Ted and Bruce, Bruce's t terms expire. 
Um, I'll be staying on, uh, along with, I forget who the other person is, and we have one person, uh, Steve Kennedy, who's uh, volunteered to uh, take a director's position, which will vote on. So we need a president, a secretary, and another director. So we're looking for volunteers. If we don't get any, Phil and I are gonna put everybody's name on one of these tickets, and we're gonna draw the president, and we're gonna draw the secretary. So you got a month to get your stuff together and help us out. We could use some, uh, use some volunteers on that. So. And we're not gonna call numbers, so you can't say it's not yours. We're gonna put your name on it. So you start working on that for me, Phil. So yeah, so if you're interested, please let us know. Uh, we wanna have a full slate uh, by next month so we can vote in June. Um, but we could use a president, a vice president, and another director. Or if a couple of you are interested, you will vote on the directors and such. Questions? Next. Oh, yeah, that's who we got as far as the current slate. Yes, please. What does each person do? Yeah. Okay, you see what Bob does up there up front. He kind of directs everything that's going on. Bill sets up all the programs, but he's going to stay. The treasurer, you see what John has been doing. It's, and it's a lot, that's a tough job. Um, that's why you're trying to keep him for five years because it's really a, a lot to keep up on. The directors, we're just there to give advice, get some thoughts, vote on things, um, keep them straight. So if you're interested, please put your name in it. Yes. Te uh, Yeah, you have to be a member for a year. You member for one year. Good question. Thank you. Other questions? Get your names in early. Or I'm going to start drawing names. So, all right. Next slide. Thank you. It's a lot of work, but it's worth it. I'm here to tell you, it's worth it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just going to chat real quick about Rising Star Construction Project. As soon as I get my phone to operate. There we go. So one little, to, we can just turn on the lights. It's off the cuff. Um, so watch your eyes, please. Three, two, one. Okay. So, <clears throat> as usual, uh, I had a pretty aggressive goal for when I was hoping to have uh, the Rising Star uh, project completed. I was hoping for May the 4th. That's just not going to happen. The weather is uh, mitigating against us. Um, we do have work parties every weekend, except we're not gonna have one this weekend. The weather is gonna be uh, lousy, and um, I think a bunch of us kind of need a break anyway. So uh, where are we? All of the pads have been, um, the power has been turned on, so they're all electrified. So if you, if you go out there, you don't need batteries, you don't need generators. And it was an awesome experience to image the other night and have peace and quiet. So, yeah. I'm sorry? That's only where the pads are. So, um, uh, some of the pads have been digitized and that means that um, the network connections. Um, uh, Palmer, how many did we finish up? Just the th two or three? Three. Okay, so we did three. Yes. Not yet. Um, I'll get to that. Yeah. So we're getting there. So anyway, some uh, not all the pads are digitized, but we're working on that. Uh, the the first two for sure are, and we've tested, we've done RDP across the, the network, so, um, so that we need to finish that. So here's, here's what we have left to do. Digitizing the le leased pads, completing the Noble Observatory. Um, we have to level it and get the controller motors working and start putting equipment in there. We're finishing the concrete work, we have four footers for the astronomy and education building 
um, to put in. I believe all four footer, I know the footers are dug and I believe all the frames are in place. So we're gonna have a concrete guy come out there and do, finish that work. Um, and as we're doing that, we're gonna create a, another public pad. And the reason for that is that uh, a full load is six yards of concrete. And if you don't get six yards, you get to pay an extra 100 bucks. So for the four footers, it's 5.33 yards of concrete. And to put another public uh, eight by eight pad out there is about another yard and a quarter, yard and a half. So it's an extra 63 bucks the way I look at it. So we'll have an additional public pad out there. Um, once uh, the concrete is done, we wait a week and then we can have the containers installed. And uh, then we'll have to do, has, have to have, ask Mike Tier and Mike Sweat to come out and do the electrical work inside the education and astronomy building. And uh, then we'll set, set the date for the dedication and opening um, sometime in May. And that's, that's where we are. Um, if you please, by all means, the pads are available for use right now, even the leased ones, because they're not leased yet. And uh, uh, it, the electricity makes a heck of a difference. It makes it quiet. So, and as Bruce has talked about, and, and I think I've said in the past, Rising Star, compared to when we got it, two years ago, and today it's like the 18th green of the Masters. Pretty, pretty cool. So one last thing, Bruce mentioned the ruts. Um, can you bring that presentation up? And um, so, uh, Bruce, I'm, let, I'll bring the mic to you, Bruce, and you can, you're the subject matter expert. Okay, so we did did notice that we did, had the ruts in the road, so we needed to get that repaired, and we discussed a couple of options, but the option that looked most viable is to um, repair the, the ruts um, and then put road base down to, ma to make a more stable surface. And the plan is to uh, hire Hubbard Construction to repair mm -hmm. the road, and then they, we will deliver 48 yards of road base in the smaller delivery trucks, and then Hubbard would use their skid steer to spread it, that material from our gate um, on through the road, past the place that we have the ruts, or where the ruts appeared, no. but it won't go all the way to the uh, edge of the observing field. Um, but the, the nice thing about it is as you come in the gate, you can just essentially follow the yellow brick road or follow the road base material to get to the observing um, field. Uh, so what is road base? So it's essentially limestone and granite that's mixed up with um, some dust material that forms a hard surface. And it it's used as a foundation for many roads and driveways. Um, as you drive to Rising Star, you're on a dusty, um, country road and that's road base material. So it's essentially, we're extending the uh, experience from uh, County Road 244 into our driveway, uh, through the gate and then into the road under the tr between the trees. Um, in terms of the project cost, um, uh, the time and material is $2,200. Uh, $1,700 of that is associated with the road base material and getting it deli delivered and then the labor to have Hubbard Construction spread that material where we want it, it's, it's essentially $2,200. And then our not to exceed price would be $2,530 to accommodate any um, increases in the material cost between what was April 5th and then uh, when we can get the um, material delivered in the near future if this proposal is accepted. Try the next slide. Is there another slide? That's it. Okay, Bob. Any questions? 
Yes, Michael. Can you speak on what would keep this stuff from washing away down the road? Because I know that the problem we're having is due to erosion and the way that the water flows through the property. And I'm wondering if putting this road base down is going to create a solid surface, Bruce, or is there a risk of it washing away over the years? So the, the reason the water pools in that particular area is because it's draining off the high side of the south edge of our property. Um, and it drains fairly fast. It's, it's sandy material. And the reason we have the water pooling there and the ruts forming is just that we had high use on the, on the road due to construction activities. Normally, when it rains out at Rising Star, we don't get out there to, to go to the observing field immediately after it rains. We wait a day or, day or two, um, and that's enough time for the water to drain away. So I don't think we would see a reoccurrence of what we experienced today um, or this year um, just because of the usage of, the, of Rising Star. We don't have the traffic that we, that we see, saw this year. Any other questions? Yes, Pam. Eight total. Oh, okay. There, there are eight club pads or public pads. One of them is the Noble Observatory, so that's that's a I consider that a club pad. And then there are seven open pads that any member can use. Uh, to clarify, there are five eight by eight pads. Those are dedicated public pads. We're adding another for six, and there are. I think one or two eight by 10 pads that are not scheduled to be leased. Well, once, if they do become leased, then they, they're not public pads. Is that helpful? Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay, the board uh, met earlier this evening and we recommend um, uh, the uh, Kalichi uh, road base repair. So uh, because of the, the amount of money involved, we, we need to have a vote. So um, I make a motion. Well, John's got a question. Why is this designated as general plan? Because it's a maintenance on the Rising Star Observing Area. It has nothing to do with construction. Okay. We have a motion to approve the money for the repairs. Seconded. All in favor? I, I think we have approved by acclamation. Okay. Um, anybody have any other business? Next slide. So next month we've got um, Tom Field He's uh, from a company called RSpec Astro, and he has software, and it is basically enables the amateur astronomer to be able to study and measure and observe the spectrums of stars and whatever's in the sky that's, you know, giving off light. So um, uh, that's uh, actually. Uh, a very cool thing, I met him, actually I met him at Neef, where I got this shirt, and uh, it's, it's really actually a pretty fantastic thing, so that's, that's uh, he's our guest uh, for our presentation next month, and we also, uh, like Cy has uh, said, that we've got uh, uh, our club leadership nominations uh, to be announced. I, I do want to say one more thing, is I want to thank Cy Simonson for uh, hooking us up with uh, Chris Cassidy tonight. Uh, it's an absolute treat. Thank you very much. That's it. Oh, do your thing. I um, I'll no. yeah. uh, next slide, please. And um, if there are no other questions, I'll 
make a motion that the meeting move to the social house, which is actually a real place down the street. The food is good, the beer is cold. And uh, I want to thank everybody for attending, folks that are here and folks that are online. Have a great evening.